from Wine Sander Spooner University. And he's going to proudly present Government and the Sham of Access to Public Land. And without further ado, here's Rob. Okay, thank you, Dave. Yeah, my name is Roger Roots. I'm from Montana. Uh, I'm the founder of Lysander Spooner University, which is uh, mostly an online libertarian blog at the moment. I hope to turn it into a, uh, an actual uh, block in uh, Mortar University in the future. Uh, first university of its kind. I also want to say that uh, I'm uh, an attorney. I'm, uh, I've worked on the uh, Bundy defense teams, both in Oregon and Nevada. Um, we've, had, we've had some great success. And I, uh, I'm also an outdoorsman myself. In fact, I, 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 I probably would make an open challenge here that I spent, I generally spend more nights a year in a sleeping bag than almost anyone. I'm a backpacker. I like to climb mountains, or at least try to climb mountains. I love to... Uh, hike and, and fish and, and uh, whitewater raft and I'm, I probably spend more days uh, off uh, in, the, in the great outdoors than anyone else I know, at least on my days off. Uh, I've got a little PowerPoint presentation and I will go ahead and have my uh, PowerPoint presentation control man flip to the next, uh, uh, the next screen. My topic is the sham of access to public land. That's a, an image of Chris Christie, governor of New, uh, New Jersey. And uh, some of you may know that that photo was taken at a time when the beaches of New Jersey were closed to the public uh, because the, there was a government shutdown in the state of New Jersey, a budget uh, impasse of some kind. And the governor of New Jersey, Chris Christie, uh, was, uh, they said, seated like a beached whale on the beach. He literally uh, was the only person allowed on that beach, he and his family. So they came out on the beach, they, clo they actually had cops telling the public they could not use the beach, even though it was a public beach, because the state uh, was at a budget impasse and was shut down temporarily. So this is what really uh, is the essence of access to public lands. It's all about control. It's about government control over public lands. And what happened to uh, Annette and Victor Fuentes here on this property is all about control. What happened when the government uh, uh, misdirected and diverted their, their river and their stream out here over onto the, the uh, wildlife refuge and uh, diverted it around this private property was all about control. It has absolutely nothing to do with saving any fish or uh, saving any, any endangered species. In fact, uh, all evidence shows that, that that act probably damaged the endangered species, the fish, in this case. Next slide, please. Uh, this is the actual BLM website right now. If you go on the BLM website, they talk about unparalleled, unparalleled access to the outdoors. And it's all, it's all a sham because, uh, go ahead and click to the next one. I'm just going to go through some of the examples that we have around us here. Uh, that's some BLM land right there. That's uh, BLM controlled land not far from us. That's Gold Strike Canyon. Anyone been to Gold Strike Canyon? Uh, it's over there on the other side of Las Vegas, uh, very near the Colorado River. It's actually closed in the summertime. This is what they call access to public lands. Closed in the summertime, there's all kinds of signs saying that you'll be arrested if you hike that trail in the summertime because, you know, there's the danger of heat stroke. There's heat. It's too hot. And so you'll be arrested. And it's, there's signs everywhere. And by the way, there's another hot spring trail on the other side of the river called the Arizona Hot Springs. Uh, same uh, ge geologic uh, heat, geothermal uh, fissure system there. And it is also closed in the summertime to hikers. You'll be arrested if you go there. Next slide, please. That is the uh, uh, Monument Valley, Utah. Very beautiful. We've seen it in a lot of Western movies. Uh, anybody ever been there? Yes. Yeah. Uh, you're actually barred from actually walking close. You can't walk around any of those structures. I've been there myself, and I was shocked. You can take a picture about that far out, but you're not allowed to even walk around those structures. There's no trails. There's uh, all kinds of signs saying that you'll be arrested if you get close. And, and, 
and there's patrols and surveillance cameras everywhere. Next slide, please. This is the Grand Canyon. Now, I love the Grand Canyon. I'm often in the Grand Canyon. Um, there are so many rules and regs in the Grand Canyon. Uh, if you go overnight inside the Grand Canyon, you're supposed to get a permit, backcountry permit, and of course, there's only so many given out. You have to apply in advance. Uh, by the way, not too far in advance. There's a particular window. And if you apply too far in advance, you're blocked. If, you're if you apply too close to the date, you're also blocked. And you have to tell the government exactly where you're going. They actually have forms where they want your footprint size. Supposedly under the, under the ruse that they want to be able to find you if you get lost. It's all a scam. Um, I've taken, I actually had just put my sleeping bag, very lightweight sleeping bag, in a day pack so that I appear like a day packer. And I, I believe I'm not the only one. You see people walking around. The common practice is to go around inside the Grand Canyon with a day pack, with a sleeping bag. I've actually been confronted at the bottom of the Grand Canyon by an armed uh, park ranger with a weapon on her hip. And she says, where did you come from? Where are you going? I said, I'm a day hiker. I came from the South Rim. She wanted to know what time I left and everything. Oh, she said, you're a pretty good hiker. I said, yes, I am. Thank you very much. <laughs> but uh, this is the kind of, this is what they call access to public lands. Next slide. Red Rock Canyon, we all know it well. You know, they close it every night at what, 5.30, 6, 7 o'clock. You're barred from parking there overnight, barred from hiking in there overnight. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, I'm not even sure you can get backcountry permits at Red Rock. One person is shaking his head yes, but there's so many rules and regs there, and there's armed BLM running around with body armor. They've actually shot and killed people there who moved wrong or took a, a step in the wrong direction. Next slide. This is the worst one I can even think of. Mesa Verde National Park. Anyone seen this? Mesa Verde National Monument? I believe it's in Southern Colorado. This is shocking because if you actually go there, you can only get about a half a mile from it. Anybody been there? You literally have to look through a telescope at that. You're not allowed to go down there. You're not allowed to take a, a trail down in the, anywhere, even approaching those Pueblo structures. Again, there's surveillance, cameras everywhere, uh, agents with body armor, automatic weapons, the whole bit. This is what the public calls access to public lands. Next slide, please. This is a place I'm very familiar with in Montana. It's called the Boiling River. It's a part of Yellowstone National Park. I live very near there, maybe 50 miles north of there. It's a great place. Uh, if you look at that picture, uh, that's the Boiling River joining the Gardner River. The Gardner River is freezing cold. The Boiling River is boiling hot. And you try to sit and find a nice uh, mixture of hot and cold there. It's a great place, especially when it's freezing in the wintertime. You can sit and soak in the great hot springs. As of right now, it's completely closed to the public. Um, it's uh, almost every time I drive by there, it's closed, or there's too many people there, ironically. So it's a little, com it's either a combination of too many people and you can't find a place in the parking spot, or it's just closed for one reason or another. They say that it's uh, eroding too, too badly or it's too high, the water's too high, too low. Whatever, next slide. This is Mount Rainier. Um, I've tr I'm a high pointer. I'm, I'm one of these guys that tries to climb the highest point in every state. Uh, I think I'm up to about 45 or 46 high points myself. Wow. I've tried and failed to climb Mount Rainier what, at least three or four or five times. Last time I tried to climb it was with uh, Neil Wampler, actually, when he was on trial in Oregon up there along with uh, Ryan Bundy. <laughs> Neil Wampler and I tried to climb Mount Rainier, and uh, it's in, we only got about halfway up. But uh, the point there is these, the rules and regulations are so severe that they actually put the public at risk, great risk. Uh, you have to apply in advance, pay a big uh, uh, permit fee. You have to tell them who you're with, where you're going, what route you're going to take. And of course, you know, for a guy who's not been there, you don't even know what route is best. And uh, when you try to apply by yourself, they usually deny you because you're supposed to go in groups. And so you, it's, uh, you try to find other hikers, other climbers, 
uh, and it's not always easy to do, but you're almost always barred, by, for, uh, barred from going by yourself. It actually puts you at great risk because you end up trying to bag the peak, which is, of course, the highest point in the state of Washington. You, you end up trying to bag it in the dark or in the middle of the night with a flashlight or whatever. And, of course, it's, again, the same scenario, constant surveillance, cops everywhere, body armor, machine guns, helicopters. <laughs> Next slide. <laughs> um, there's this immense culture of, of a, a narrative. There's a cultural narrative about access to public lands and how, how great the public lands and all the great economic benefits are. This is a, an organization called the Outdoor Industry Association, which puts out an annual report about all the money that uh, outdoor recreation uh, raises. Uh, $887 billion annually, this, the outdoor recreational industry raises. Of course, most of you know the, the GDP of the country is about $16 billion. So they're essentially claiming that, uh, what, somewhere between 5 and 10% of, of, of U.S. GDP is outdoor recreation. Hard to believe, but if you look into their, their uh, so-called study, they, they count every pair of Nike's shoes as the outdoor industry. They count every boat sold as the outdoor industry. Every four-wheel drive is part of the outdoor recreational industry. Anyway, we could quibble with the study, but if you live in the West, like we all do, you're frequently treated to, new, to a newspaper story about every year by every one of these agencies, BLM, Forest Service, National Park Service, etc. Every year they put out a study saying something, and the headline will run in every newspaper about all the billions and millions of dollars that uh, the national, local national park brings into, into the local economy in, in Montana or here in Nevada. Uh, and of course the BLM will put out another one saying that millions of dollars were brought in by this piece of land, uh, public land. And, and of course, if you really look closely, it's, uh, it's tricks. It's, it's uh, use of tricks of rhetoric uh, to achieve this so-called economic bottom line. Um, Obviously, when you really think about it, if you're going to do an economic study, the cost of the staff of the BLM, the cost of the staff of the Forest Service, the National Park Rangers, if you're, if you're going to say they're providing a service, then their salaries would have to be on the expense part of the ledger. Those would be losses. They're, those would be liabilities. They'd be expenses. And yet, those salaries are listed as part of the economic uh, benefit, when in fact they should be on the subtraction line. And yet again, I can quibble all day long. Well, the one thing they don't, they don't do is they don't account for lost opportunity costs. They don't tell the reader of the, of the annual report of the newspaper what that piece of land would have brought had it not been uh, controlled by you know, the National Park Service. If it was sold to the highest bidder, if it was used for ranching, logging, uh, mining, they don't give you the lost opportunity costs. Next slide. Um, I'm a recurring libertarian candidate. I'm, I'm currently a candidate for Montana clerk of the state Supreme Court in Montana, libertarian candidate. And, uh, so I, and I've run for U.S. Senate uh, as a libertarian candidate, Montana Secretary of State, etc. One problem is a lot of people don't know what a libertarian is, and they say, what's the libertarian party? And, uh, you know, I, I often get into arguments with the hierarchy of the libertarian party, the people in charge of the party. And they, 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 they use these wishy-washy terms. They say things like, uh, well, we're conservative economically and we're, uh, we're uh, socially liberal, something like that. Well, most people don't even know what this means. I always say, listen, if we just were honest with the voters that we are the party that hates government the most, we would start winning elections by landslides. <laughs> uh, but anyways, I'm frequently met with the question, well, what about public lands? Would you, would you, you know, give away, sell off, uh, you know, uh, sell off all these public lands? Would you sell Yellowstone National Park to the highest bidder? You, know, you want privatization of all these public lands? And my answer is always sort of, uh, I give an answer. Uh, libertarians have a hard time dealing with this because it's frankly, it's a loser for our, for our party. So we deal with it in different ways. I deal with it like this. I say, well, listen. Yellowstone National Park is in no danger. Uh, the Grand Canyon is in no danger. It's not going to be subplatted and zoned out for condominiums. It's not going to happen. There's no possible political scenario in which that's going to happen. Now, 
On the other hand, there are vast tracts of public land that shouldn't be public land. They, in fact, should be auctioned off to the highest bidder. You know, there are national parks that exist solely because they, they were in a state where that state had no national park and they wanted to create one. So they looked around, well, what can we do? There are places in the Midwest called national grasslands. If you look carefully, they're just old ranches that went bankrupt at one time or another and were lost to the county and then the county gave them to the state and the state gave them to the federal government. Uh, you can see this all over the place. They call it national grasslands. Yes, the answer is I would, there, I don't see a great value in having, you know, such and such national grassland in Nebraska, Kansas, whatever. Next slide. Um, you know, on the other hand, there is the worst case scenario, Jeremoth Hill. This is the highest point in Rhode Island. Now, I actually lived in Rhode Island. I know a lot, of, a lot about Rhode Island. I went to law school in Rhode Island. Jeremoth Hill, the highest point in Rhode Island where I have bagged. I've, I've summited 812 <laughs> feet. It's actually very close to the highway. But it's on private land. Or at least when I was there, it was on private land. And worst case scenario, at, probably happened at Jeremoth Hill in 2000, go ahead and click to the next one, 2002, a couple of high pointers who were trying to bag the highest point in Rhode Island, walked off the highway, walked onto the private land 100 feet or, two, or 200 feet to where the, uh, the marker is for the highest point in Rhode Island. The landowner, or maybe it was the landowner next door, uh, came out and uh, brandished a shotgun, uh, fired a round of shotgun in the air and had him, uh, you know, lay on the ground. Police were called. I actually sympathize greatly with both of them. I, I sympathize greatly with the hikers and I sympathize with the landowner because, you know, they shouldn't have to have trespassers jumping over the fence and trying to bag their, their uh, little marker uh, uh, the highest point in the state of Rhode Island, but on the same, at the same token, I guess, I think the market is the best way to solve that problem. After all, if you really own the highest point in your state, number one is probably of value to you to to exploit it as much as you can. And I'm sure that that guy could probably make a buck or two. I've been to the highest point in, I believe, North Dakota, where they have a tip jar, yeah. tip jar at the trailhead. Hey, private land, would you chip in five bucks to park here and go there, you know? Um, or you can do other things. You could build a 12-foot high chain link fence with barbed wire if you really didn't want high pointers visiting your private land. There's all kinds of things the market could do. Capitalism and freedom is the solution. It's not the most perfect situation in the world. It's just better than every other option in the world. Uh, and ultimately, the market solved that problem in Rhode Island. It was sold to another private landowner who now is much more tolerant of high pointers who want to bag the highest point in Rhode Island. And they allow visitors to, climb, you know, to come on and go up the trail and say they and have a selfie at the highest point in Rhode Island. Next slide. Um, I'm also reminded of the Grand Tetons. Uh, some of you may know that the Grand Tetons used to be owned by the Rockefellers. And uh, the Rockefellers donated the, the whole place to the federal government. And that's why it's now Grand Teton National Park. Um, if you look at the history, the Rockefellers, as far as we know, never chased off any high pointer uh, with a shotgun or any of those mountain climbers during the 20s or 30s or 40s when they owned that piece of land. Uh, there were hikers all the way through there. By the way, I've climbed the highest point there, Grand Teton, two or three times myself. And uh, so, you know, the point is, the, 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 there's several points about that story. Number one, I think most of us uh, are familiar with the counter story where the federal government is claiming uh, ownership and falsely claiming rights uh, to manage land that it never really relinquished to the private sector. But here's an example where the private sector had it uh, in, in actual deeded and plotted title and gave it to the federal government. So you see all these kinds of different scenarios. Next slide. Fascinating story. If you, if you really look at the history of government property, there was much more greater access to it in the past. 
this is a book by David Brinkley called Washington Goes to War. It documents the fact that in the 1920s and 30s and 40s, you could go to the White House, there was no armed guard. You could visit, they would give you a tour, and sometimes if they weren't there to give you a tour, and if the president wasn't there, you could sit in the president's chair and bounce up in his chair. With no oversight, no giving identification card, no identification whatsoever. That was just, that wasn't that long ago, 80 years ago. You could bounce up and down in the president's chair. Today, there is a surveillance grid protecting the president. The president's chair, the White House, you can't even get near there without having guns pointed at you. And it, it, what we really are facing is the overall just growth of the state, the expansion and intrusion of the state in our lives. Next slide. That's the Hope Diamond. Uh, an example of something that the government should never own. The tax, there's no reason in the world for the taxpayers to own the Hope Diamond. It's ridiculous. It's the stupidest thing in the world. No point to it whatsoever. It's in the Smithsonian Institution, which is government. And if you go there, it's under armed guard. The Hope Diamond is supposedly one of the most valuable gems in the world. And I've been there myself. There's an armed guard there watching you the entire time you look at it under glass. And yes, I would sell the Hope Diamond to the highest bidder immediately. It needs to be sold. <laughs> She actually makes a very good point. Many of these things are actually donated by wealthy people to the government. But again, there's no reason why they need to be owned by the government at all. Like the Grand Teton. Next, uh, next slide. Uh, anyway, there are so many ways the market could fix the problem without the government controlling everything. Um, the Nature Conservancy. Now here we are, we're probably thinking the Nature Con I'm going to say something bad about the Nature Conservancy. It's an environmentalist group. It's with the left, generally speaking. However, I will say this. It is based on a libertarian model. It is based on a capitalistic model. In that, it is based on a model where the private sector pools its resources and purchases sacred, uh, valuable, uh, particularly uh, you know, um, prestigious places and holds them in trust for people to have access to. This is actually a libertarian model. And so as bad as the Nature Conservancy is, it is actually a libertarian model. It's the one environmentalist group that I would say a libertarian could endorse. Now, of course, in reality, we all know they take over land, land is donated to them, and then they give it to the state or the federal government. By the way, they do so often because they're forced to because of property taxes. I'm being given the, the, uh, the uh, get off the stage, Mark. One more, one more slide, please. Um, uh, the, the history of saving endangered species is the history of the private sector doing so. The very first wildlife refuge was private. It was in Pennsylvania and it saved the, the eagles and hawks of Pennsylvania. Complete private sector. It doesn't need to be done by government. Next slide, there's the final one about the, the elephant. Did you know that the second largest refuge for elephants that is saving African elephants is private? It's owned by the private sector. The private sector does such a better job at anything than the government. Often what the government does is destroy things rather than save things. And I would say that right here, uh, we're, we're talking about endangered fish, the pupfish and the dace fish here. They would all be saved overnight, immediately, if you could buy, sell, kill, cook, and eat the fish. They would be saved overnight. Thank you very much. That's right. It is my special pleasure to introduce our final guest of the night, at least our final speaker. We may have a couple other uh, people who come up with a, cut, a cameo or two. This next man, uh, I can only say, uh, I could go on and on, but there's very few people who've ever faced a felony charge in their lives. Almost no one has faced... 24 felony charges in their lives, all right, and beat them all. Yeah. Yeah. And <laughs> even further, he represented himself. And I sat next to him in the trial in Oregon, and the guy did a better job than almost all the other attorneys there. And he beat in, uh, six counts, felony charges in Oregon, by himself, representing himself. 
I was paralegal. I helped him out a little bit of legal research. Then he beat uh, 16 counts plus several forfeiture uh, counts down here in Nevada. And of all the Bundy defendants, Ryan Bundy faced more total felony charges than any other defendant, including Ammon Bundy or Cliven Bundy. He faced more than any of them, and he beat every single charge by himself without an attorney. Ladies and gentlemen,